before we begin, a quick disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment and information purposes only. It should not be relied upon as a base for any investment decision. Security. Either the host, guests, or clients of either may own securities discussed on this podcast. Uh, welcome to another episode of uh, the Special Situations cast. Uh, today I have a very special guest. Uh, it's Aaron Edelheid, of, and he's the author of The Heartbreak, The Case for a 24-6 Lifestyle. He's also the CEO of Mindset Capital, and he manages the Mindset um, value fund. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming on. And uh, you've, um, you've had quite an amazing career. I um, know you, I think because of Twitter and because you started writing a sub stack called Mindset Value and you talk about your life and uh, your career and you started out managing money um actually above your parents garage i think in uh, yes. 1998 so just before the f- um the internet crash uh i, I yes. don't know it, it, actually it was it was i started three months before people forget that there was a, a hedge fund that blew up called long-term capital management mm-hmm. in august of 1998 and um caused a liquidity crisis in the market it's it's forgotten actually because of how big the bubble was but there was a hedge fund long-term capital management that levered like a hundred or a thousand to one blew up and the whole market seized and the federal reserve had to get all the banks together and provided a bunch of liquidity and part of that liquidity that they uh put into the market to solve the problem actually led to some of the excesses uh, in the dot-com bubble. So I started in June of 1998, a friend had sold his business and, um, and, uh, and, and I started managing some of his money um, above my parents' garage. And three months into it, this, long, this hedge fund blew up and everything seized and liquidity was really tight. And if you're investing in small companies, um, you know, it, it was just, initially like very painful um but then it resolved itself pretty quickly and 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 it started going and then the dot-com bubble came and everything so it was a you know it was a couple of years there where it was you know pretty wild uh not that dissimilar to what happened uh um you know last year with the virus and that you have an explosion of liquidity provided from the central banks uh leading to yet another bubble and speculative activity it, it's it's a nice um it's a very interesting time and i've actually written about this how much this environment reminds me of 1999 and 2000 okay so let's uh and then so your friend you had like an uh, internet business so i no I no 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 it was, it was actually oh, okay. student loans um, oh so that was a coincidence it was just total coincidence um I've always been interested in investments. I've always talked stocks. For some reason, I've been reading the Wall Street Journal since I was like nine or 10. I don't know why. My dad showed me the stock tables in the newspaper back then, and I was just immediately fascinated. And so when I was in college, I would constantly talk about stocks and research stocks. And so I had a friend, and I was the only person who knew anything about investing. And so when he built this business with his father, you know, two years out of college, he sold it and suddenly had money. And I was the only person that he knew who knew anything about investing. And he asked for my help. Okay. So that's how I got started. And I was so young and um, naive that I thought, oh, I know everything there is to that. I can invest this money well. And, you know, it worked out great. I, I, mm-hmm. I was able to invest for him and then grow that into a small hedge fund Um in uh, 2003, and then um, grew that uh, to about 20 or 25 million dollars. Uh, uh, and so, so anyway, it worked out well. Um, I learned a lot, and uh, you yeah. know, especially what reminds me of 99, 2000 is that I had a real, I had a good year in 99, but my, I had three years of kind of great performance. 2000, 2001, 2002 as a value investor and small cap investor 
because when the dot com kind of crashed, everything else started kind of taking off. Um, and so that's what's so interesting about this current, this current, this current period is it reminds me of, and I'm finding a lot of opportunities that once you get past the top couple hundred stocks, um, small caps and international stocks are just selling at really, really great valuations. Um, yeah. Wonderful for a value investor and provide incredible opportunity because no one's really paying attention to them. Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, you know, I really want to talk about that, but uh, let me go back a little bit uh, before. I think you've had like a great run at that time with that fund that you started um, together with your friend, like 11 years and you outperformed by 8% or something uh, annually. Is that right or directionally right? Okay, can you repeat that one more time? Oh, um, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you outperformed over 11 years. Yes, 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 yes. Year? Yeah? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, my average return, uh, you know, from, from uh, 2000, 2002, I was like averaging 25% returns a year. I thought I was a golden god. And then, yeah. then started under, uh, underperformed for 2003 and 2004. So But over that time, time period from 98 till uh, 2011, I averaged 11% a year compounded yeah. returns. Um, and the market over that time was only up about 3%. Um, oh, okay. And so uh, outperformed by about, you know, 800 basis points a year and, uh, you know, did well. What happened is in 2008, Uh, I started as a side project buying foreclosed homes, fixing them up and renting them out and um, started with and launched a small partnership, thought it was just going to be a side business um, when during the foreclosure crisis, started with 16 homes and then by 2011 had like 250 homes and decided to wind down my hedge fund in 2011 to really focus on what I thought was an incredible opportunity once in a lifetime to buy houses. Um, and, and, and then grew that to 2,500 uh, single family rentals in uh, 2012 and 2013. We sold the company in 2015. Um, after that, I, I launched a small part, real estate partnership. I uh, invested in some startups. I joined a friend startup called Flow Technologies Um, that was a water technology uh, that detects leaks and stops your water if, in case there's a catastrophic event. Hel helped him run that, and the company was acquired uh, in late 2019 um, by uh, Fortune Brands. Moen is the, is the brand that most famous. Um, and then when everything kind of hit with, uh, with COVID, I saw the incredible disparity in valuations and uh, decided I wanted to get back into public investing and launched the Mindset Value Fund. Um, and so I'm back at my first true love, which is researching and finding great opportunities in the public markets. Yeah, and, uh, and how, how, how do you enjoy it? Like, um, it's been a crazy year and- uh... Well, it's been, a, it's been a crazy year. I really didn't get, uh, you know, money started flowing in, didn't get fully invested in, until like the end of June. Um, but there's so much opportunity. I know this is, sounds so weird with the markets near highs and so many crazy valuations going on, but once you get past those top companies and the companies everybody talks about in the hottest sectors, there really is wonderful opportunities in the stock market. So I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying writing yeah. about it. And, you know, it helps. It's a very, it's a very positive market. So, you know, I finished the year up uh, over, you know, 51.5% after <laughs> fees. So that feels good as well. Yeah. But I think what I most enjoy is not, not just the return, which is a nice validation of the work, Um, but just finding the opportunities, the misunderstood or the stocks no one's paying attention to or are not investing in and, and finding those, that's what I'm just loving. And I'm loving not only finding them, investing in them, but also writing about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, 
Uh, yeah, I hate everyone who's up like 50% so much. Yeah, no, congratulations. Oh, I'm so, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm you hate me. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. To be honest, to be honest I, I, ha I um, made a, a number of mistakes. I even wrote about <laughs> one of them that I missed this company called Terrasend. Um, mm -hmm. Went up six, it's up, I, it's like five or 600% in nine months. Oh, that is a big miss. Yeah. While I should have, while I was up, you know, 51, 51, 52% for mm -hmm. the year, to be honest, I should have been up 75 or 80. <laughs> and, um, you know, I made a number of mistakes um, and I'm trying to learn from those mistakes. And that's why I'm writing a lot more and sharing um, to just because I find that there's a clarity when you write. Um, and so I should have been up more last year. Last year was a kind of a, a really incredible time. I'm still a very bullish on my portfolio this year, even though I see like a lot of speculative excess in the market. Um, you know, we could talk about some of the stocks that, uh, that I like, but yeah, I, I think there's still a lot of opportunity, especially in small cap companies and, and especially internationally. Yeah. So outside but, um, the U S outside yeah. the U S yeah. Uh, like I, I think I'm sort of on the same page with you because for like the last three, three years, I've always like tempered people's expectations of, uh, me investing for them or uh um yeah but now um there's you know i'm totally in agreement there's so much opportunity and at the same time there's a huge what feels like a bubble going on it's, and it's yeah. how do you and that's why it reminds how me can of I have the same thing? that's that's why it reminds me of 99 2000 you can observe what's happening in yeah. the electric vehicle space you can yeah. observe what's happening in the SaaS. The, the software as a service coming the high tech stock, huge mm. multiples. And you can observe that and you can go ahead and say like, that's ridiculous. And it is, it's a lot of ridiculousness going on. Um, and, and there's a number of reasons why that's existing. But at the same time, if you're investing in businesses yeah. and, those, and, the, and you feel like you have an opportunity to invest in a great business yeah. and a what you consider a low valuation mm -hmm. and there's tremendous you know kind of upside then well yeah it, it it matters to pay attention to that but that over the long term that really shouldn't affect your investment um unless it becomes systemic which is uh which can happen like during the uh the financial crisis Mm -hmm. um, the housing market got so insane and so over levered, it threatened the entire financial system. Um, and so you always have to pay attention to that. But, you know, you know one of the stocks that, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, that, that I really like is Nintendo. Um, and Nintendo uh, sells for 13 times this year's earnings. And this year ends in March, so you're like two, two months away. And 13 uh, times earnings outside of cash and investments. And if you, you know, if you, if you uh, take out the cash and investments it's, and just assume that that's a zero, it's 18 times. Uh, but their earnings are, you know, last quarter, their earnings are up 250%. And they're having a transformation in their business where they're going from this kind of boom bust console cycle to kind of more smoother uh, subscription businesses, the digital software business is much more profitable than the cartridge sales. And they're having a stickier relationship and they're, they're kind of rallying around one platform, which is their switch console, which will last longer. They'll iterate and they're trying to make into an iPhone type ecosystem where people just keep replacing their switch and keep all their software on the cloud. And, and so what's interesting is I get this, this company that's in a boom sector, right? There's a huge growth prospects. I don't think anyone could disagree that video games is a huge total addressable market that is growing and will continue to grow for decades. Um, and the fact that I get such an amazing company for such a, what I think is a reasonable valuation Mm -hmm. um, to me, 
is, is pretty remarkable. And I think it's uh, partly because it's in Japan. It's not the U.S. It's also partly because the company um, uh, historically uh, doesn't pay that much attention to investor relations. So in our current time of hype and, you know, uh, excess around, you know, grandiose promises and, you know, flashy investor relations, they don't fit in. And so the company, I think, unfairly gets discounted. Um, and But that fits in kind of with the style of how I'm trying to run the Mindset Value Fund. Okay. I'm trying to run it under the, the idea of low downside, uncertain upside. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and so, so this is how I'm grap I'm balancing that there's, hey, there's a lot of excess, but at the same time, yeah. there's a lot of opportunity. And my experience shows me is that, that like the dot com, when the dot coms collapsed, I had three years of 25% annualized net returns. And I'd like to think I can do better because I didn't really know what I was doing back then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, looking back. And so yeah. I see tremendous opportunity because of that. Let people go crazy. As yeah. long as there isn't a systematic, syst systemic risk, let them go crazy. Let me ha ha invest and, and enjoy all the, you know, being an investor in these wonderful businesses that people aren't paying attention to, but they mm -hmm. will. So, um, like, yeah, I think two, two things. Like, um, I love to talk more about Nintendo, so I'm going to do it in, in a minute. But are you uh, familiar with the Mike Green uh, thesis about, um, uh, like, passive investing, how that's changing markets? or um, is it No, no, I, it's definitely changing markets. Yeah? And it's another thing that I am you know, consider and understand. And so understanding where investment flows go, can and can't go is very important, um, um, is a very important thing. And, and we can talk, you know, understanding that, finding opportunities either before that massive yeah. passive flow can get into those stocks or finding outside of them. Mm -hmm that's where there's tremendous opportunity yeah and i think you're like on the edge of that where are you looking because i know like the names that you're look, or at least a few of the names that you're looking at and um they're outside of the like the main index flows but they're not that far outside like nintendo could easily uh, become included in like booming etfs and some of your other yeah. picks too i think uh, but it's definitely been problematic if you were like, oh, I'm just going to look for super deep value outside, totally outside. Yeah, of see, I think that that, that investment, look, I think you can occasionally find that, but that's gone. The idea that with the, the uh, information technology tools at people's disposals, the algorithmic trading, computerized trading, passive investment flows, um, the variety of kind of strategies that can be put on autopilot. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that you and I could do traditional deep value investing in, especially like in the U S it's just think about how much brain power is out there, how much computer firepower is out there. The idea that those opportunities still exist in today's world after being passed over by hundreds or thousands of computers seems highly unlikely to me. And so what I try to do is look where they are not looking and mm -hmm. look where the, the, the kind of the fish are because vet tr traditional value and value investing, you know, especially in the U S um, we're overfished okay. between uh, the amount of eyeballs that are looking at stuff. And so you have to find opportunities where they're just not there or there are structural reasons why they can't go and invest there. And so, you know, I, you yeah. know, that's oh, okay. how I, I, that's how I look at things. 
and I, I'm watching how other people do traditional value, especially in the U.S. And it's it just seems very unlikely that you're going to produce any outperformance. Yeah, but so um, I mean, so to sum it up, you're kind of a value investor actually, concentrated on downside and then um, uh, look for create possible upsides. And what you're doing is you're not looking for the cheapest statistical stuff, but you're really looking for qualitative uh, things that really skew it in your favor. And I think Nintendo is a great yeah. example. Well, uh, let me give you another example. You can also well, look wait, for wait, stocks wait, that, that, don't, that, that don't screen well. You know, going I'm back sure. to your part about screening for value. Yeah. So you could look and find a stock that if you were to screen for it, it looks like one thing. But underneath, it's actually right. something else when you do the qualitative work. An example of that, and I wrote a report on it, is Nelnet. So it looks like a student loan finance company, but is actually a very exciting technology company with incredible technology payments company that just happens to own a legacy student loan book portfolio of student loans. And yeah. when you separate out the student loans, you see this incredible technology company. And so that's an example of how you can use that kind of this, you know, quantitative way that people are trawling for investments. And you can find something that maybe doesn't screen well, but is actually something different. And that's another wonderful way to kind of do use value investing philosophy, but in this environment. Yeah, in a mo modern way or something. Um, so let's get back to uh, Nintendo. Um, yeah. Can you, maybe it's best if, if you do it, like explain how Nintendo makes money because maybe some people don't know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, there, there's like 30 or, well, it's actually much, much longer. It's a very old company, but the modern history, you know, they, they make consoles, the Super Nintendo system, and then they came out with the Wii, and, and they make consoles, and they make yeah. the games that go on the consoles. You know, console, in terms of video games, you can obviously play in an arcade. Not that many people play anymore in an arcade. You can play on your PC or computer. You can play on your iPhone. Um, but then there's also dedicated gaming consoles, and Nintendo not only makes the consoles, but makes most of the, the video games that sell on their console, at least the big sellers. So, and yeah. they've, over the past 30, 30, 35 years, they've, or 40 years, they've built up, you know, incredible IP uh, in terms of uh, Mario, uh, Zelda. Now we have uh, Animal Crossing. Um, you know, we have Metroid, uh, Donkey Kong. Um, you know, all these characters that people know uh, and actually now, now, now love, um, you know, Nintendo has this incredible, you know, kind of cast of characters, you know, IP brand that they've built up and they keep iterating on their games and on their consoles. And um, another thing that's really important to note is that Nintendo owns... Uh, not only directly, but through indirect holdings, they own about 50% of the Pokemon company, which a lot of people don't realize, but Pokemon actually in terms of revenue uh, is the most valuable or has sold the most stuff of any IP in the world. Um, and so they, they own that, um, they own that as well. And there's a lot of Pokemon related uh, stuff that comes on the, the, the their consoles. Their latest, so historically, there's been kind of a boom and bust as they come out with a new console, a bunch of new games to use that that new technology, and then they they kind of and then they have to refresh. And so the 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 interesting thing is in my during my past fun, mm -hmm. uh, I I love video games. So I remember when the Wii came out, um, I went to go get one, and. Uh, they were sold out and I asked the store owner like, hey, when can I get one? Uh, when, when should I show up? When's your next shipment? And he said, oh, you should come next Thursday. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, when should I show up? And he said, uh, you should show up about an hour before the star, store opens because that's when the line starts. And so I was like, 
wait, there's a line that starts before your store is open. And I immediately then started looking at the stock and looking at what people were saying about the stock. And because it's in Japan, because the company is not very promotional, um, no, no one was saying anything about how you had to show up an hour before the store opened. So I invested in it. And then the Wii obviously became very clear how popular the Wii was. Uh, it made a hundred percent investment. It wasn't, you know, it moved on to other things. And so fast forward to today that they had after the Wii, they had a couple of disappointing, uh, one or two disappointing consoles. And they developed this new console called the Switch. Uh, it's basically a uh, portable, you know, kind of console that you can easily play either in your hand or connect to a docking, docking station and play on your big screen TV. So the idea is you can literally play on your TV and then grab it and go and switch to play portable. That's the whole idea. And what was fascinating is they started, Nintendo started focusing on just this one console. They also have had handhelds that have been very successful, um, the Game Boy and DS and now they just have the Switch, which is kind of a combination of both. And it's been remarkable to watch. So I got a Switch, started playing, and I'm like, this is fantastic. The quality of games, the Super Mario Odyssey that you play, and uh, the Legend of Zelda, Zelda Breath of the Wild, just phenomenal, phenomenal gameplay. That's what Nintendo does, is phenomenal gameplay. In fact, they're notorious for sitting on a game until they feel it's perfect. Um, have you been? And, have you always been like a Nintendo gamer in your youth as well? Yeah, I like played all mind? kinds of games. I oh, played okay. all kinds of games, but you know, um, uh, and, and I love strategy games. I love all kinds of. I'm. Yeah, that's another topic. I actually okay. think playing video video games makes me a better investor, mm. and I think it's actually uh, you know that's the CEO of Shopify still plays StarCraft. Right. Yeah. He talks about yeah, how Starcraft. Starcraft has been the key, and and another game he plays, I think it's Factorio, uh, has been the, like the key to his success. And um, anyway, side note. Um, yeah. If I, so, if but, I... but no, it's it's it's. So I started playing, and it was again I had kind of deja vu of the Wii. But mm -hmm. I was like, this is amazing, and I was watching the sales and the demand, and for some reason. And the whole market was so focused on mobile games. And what they call mobile games is the, you know, the games that are on your, your, your phone. And they were, they still don't understand that the Switch is essentially a mobile console. And the whole market had kind of just abandoned the idea of a portable console, or mm -hmm. the, especially one you could use, or that people would demand this at all. And at the time, I was I was looking at Nintendo was trading at ten or eleven times earnings, no, but and it was just absurd to me. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, let me. Uh, I really like the Nintendo pieces, so so don't think like uh, super bare. But I'm going to uh, try to argue the other side of. No, people. please, so, please yeah. do, please do. So this is like the craziest thing I've ever heard. They, this is a gaming company who make games, but before they can sell a game. They first have to sell people these consoles that can only, you know, be used for their games. It is, you yes. know, it is, it's the craziest thing. Let me tell, let me tell you about the craziest. <laughs> let me argue with that point. Good. There's this crazy company <laughs> that makes really good soft software and a really great operating system, and they have this crazy idea that they're going to sell you phones. So that mm -hmm. they, so that you can use their software. Apple is crazy. <laughs> Why would they force you to get an Apple iPhone to use their Apple software? Do you how crazy? It, yeah. it sounds a little so, silly, right? So no, but do you th do you um, generally think that Nintendo tends to or has any plans yes, to build Nintendo on that console? Made Yes, Nintendo has specifically made comments mm -hmm. in a, a, a few analyst meetings and public where they said, we basically, we admire what Apple is doing. Mm -hmm. Look at what the Apple iPhone has done. And it is, 
they are basically connecting the dots and they are trying to make the switch like an iPhone. So what, what that means is you're with the cloud. The, the cloud never existed when the Wii was around. You know, the, the internet was new. Now we have all this data and storage and Nintendo never had a subscription service. They now have, you know, 26 million people who are paying monthly subscription to mm -hmm. have access to Nintendo gaming content. All of the past Nintendo games you can now play, you, you can now play, have access to. Yeah. Um, none of that existed before. You had to go back. They're no, working but, on. But like Blizzard. So what though, I mean is. Yeah. Go ahead. No, but like Blizzard, uh, of, of Blizzard Activision, they, they kind of built something similar, but without the hardware. So I, I don't want to dispute the philosophy. Like the, the philosophy of Nintendo, and they've been very, very clear. And this is where people kind of knock them. Mm -hmm. They said that if they want to provide a truly innovative and unique gaming experience, they have to control both the hardware and the software. So if you play the Nintendo Switch and you take out the Joy Cons. Mm -hmm. and, do you have a switch? I don't, but it is actually another Apple point. So, like, so, like a... so, 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 go get a switch if they're not sold out because they're sold out everywhere still. Okay, which is amazing. Three and a half years later, uh, still sold out. If I wanted to order one on Amazon, yeah, I have to wait until February, late February, to get one. Okay, yeah. so, but they came out with this Ring Fit Adventure. This is Ring. You connect the Joy-Cons, the two controllers that come out of it, into there, mm -hmm. and I can have a truly amazing exercise as a game. They sold $300 million of these things. Yeah. And so no, Nintendo's philosophy is that if they want to make the best games, mm -hmm. they want to control the hardware to provide the best experience. That's their strategy. Yeah. I, I, I get that, and, and it sounds a lot like Apple, who, who does the exact same thing, and finally, or, well, maybe not finally, but is getting vindicated for doing that. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's such a feat that they sell so many of them, but aren't they leaving so much on the table of all the people that they could reach? Because it seems like... So what I would say to game, you about that yeah. is... It's to go on mobile or to go other, well, to me, those options are not off the table. Right. They're still there. Yeah. Yeah. But if I look at Nintendo and they literally cannot make enough switches, mm -hmm. demand is so high, they cannot meet demand, then I want you to work on that. <laughs> right? How well, many different yeah. mobile games, how many different mobile games are out there? How, how do you yeah. how do you break through the noise? No, but the, the, I mean that's where the IP comes in so so great. And the first time I got interested in is because of DreamWorks Animation. I don't know if you remember that company. It was like yeah a, yeah, yeah with, uh, with, like it's famous for Shrek. And um, yeah yeah no I know DreamWorks. Yeah, so they started doing like all these series like Shrek one two three, and um, the the sequels always do great. Well. It's super low risk, and you can still have a huge home run. With gaming, it's even better. You know, there's like so many Final Fantasies, or like uh, StarCraft, or, or like World of Warcraft, have had like monthly subscriptions. Uh, it's so coming to Nintendo. All those subscriptions yeah. are coming. They're starting slow. They're being careful about it. But while they're doing it, and they're building out their Switch... And there, are, I believe later this year, there'll be another model of the Switch. How do you know that the Switch is going to become like an iPhone? Well, last year they announced the Switch Lite, which is like a more basic version, cheaper. I think they're going to announce a more powerful one this year. I also uh, think there are like rumors the... of it called the Switch Pro. And so there'll be this lineup of games, or, 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 or kind of you know, iPhone 8, iPhone 9, kind of like that thing. Remember when the iPhone had like a more basic one and a more, uh, you know, a nicer one and they give you a couple of options. But the idea is that you, you're buying the games, you're buying them digitally. 
And so what they do is yeah. they make the software so that you want to get the switch and then you're in that ecosystem. And they've been so successful, they cannot keep up with demand. So what's wild to me, it would be very different if the stock was trading at 25, 30 times earnings or 40 or some of these crazy multiples. I'll be like, yeah, you know, you're right. They, they should be doing X, Y, and Z. And there is a risk. When I'm buying it at 13 times what is essentially now trailing earnings, to be honest, they may blow away my numbers. And they're printing cash and they still cannot keep up with demand. I'll give you another example about the importance of hardware is they came out with this uh, Mario Kart Live, yeah. which is this augmented reality version where it's a radio controlled car that you can control from your switch and you can play virtual characters while you race around your own house and create your own course. They sold out in 24 hours. Now, if you're making a mobile you know, game you, and you're not controlling the hardware, you can't yeah. do innovative things like that. And you think about Legend of Zelda, you know, your swords, your bow and arrow. I've played with the Ring Fit Adventure, which is this you know, ring. It's, it's incredible how you can exercise. And I've done bow flexing and I've you know, lifted it up and you do all these things with it. Why, why can't they make that for Legend of Zelda? with like a sword and a shield. They, mm -hmm. The Joy-Con has the sensors on it. Yeah. So I, so what Nintendo can and will do, we're only seeing the first iterations of it. And they can't keep up with demand. No, I think- So like, how, how yeah. is it that they're, it trades at half the market multiple and they, they can't keep up with demand? Like I agree with you that uh, it's cheap. Like for for how how great it is, for sure. But uh, still going to to make it like you know I I like this how you how you uh, how this gets you riled up. But no, uh, no, but the other part is what's the downside? Is it going to go to eight times earnings, nine times earnings? Um, you know where does it go from here? No, but like like. It's like right now earnings are really good. Like it's it's got more EBITDA than it did in the years past. And you're arguing that's because they're taking higher margins through the digital sales. Yeah. And um, that's possible, the higher but... margins in the digital sales, more subscriptions, more people buying games. Yeah, maybe and... just a little bit due to COVID. I don't know. Do you think that in three years people will be playing more video games or less? Mm. Or more? Do you think that the market for video games will grow over the next three or five years or ten years? It will or grow. it'll decline. I think it will grow. Yeah. yeah. Of course it will. Yeah. The games are getting better. And not only that, if you look at like the dollar per hour or the yeah. the, the dollar per minute of this is yeah. the other part of my thesis is that video yeah. games are actually undervalued versus other forms of entertainment. Yeah, I, th I think so. It's, I think that's also why some of them are like really trading at super high multiples. I mean, you, you mentioned that Nintendo trades at half the market multiple, but I think you can find some gaming companies trading at- For like, sure. And those are the more flashy. Those are the ones that are more exciting. Those are the ones that are in the US or really yeah. hyping things up. And if you're this Japanese company that it doesn't really care what the stock market thinks, yeah. but is charting its own course. Yeah. yeah but really, like... it really only cares about making great games. You don't, you don't get all the flash and pizzazz that the no, US yeah. investors get. I'm a little bit worried like, okay, maybe this is like a top of the cycle earnings because it's a little bit cyclical. If you have to push these devices in people's hands and sometimes the device isn't as great or maybe competitor comes out with a um, like really great device like PlayStation is always a competitor, Xbox is a competitor and then PC, PC games are a competitor. And well, sometimes you just, you had a bad device and then, uh, you know, your cycle doesn't do as well. So earnings go down. But this, this is part of my thesis that yeah. people are missing is that the cycle 
won't be the boom and bust anymore because of the subscription, because of the digital, because of the emphasis they're now working on one platform. Yeah. And so if you, it's, and, and so, um, and because people have been talking about peak switch sales now for the past 18 months, yeah, they still cannot keep it in stock. They are addressing some kind of demand that the market is not appreciating if they still cannot keep it in in stock four years after launch. Yeah, yeah, and then I also really like that even if Nintendo like fails in an in um, you know in the near term, it's got all this IP and so many fans for of, of 20 years or 30 years look at what's opening next month in japan the super nintendo world will be the first uh, nintendo theme park next year will be the first mario movie i think yeah. it's coming i want to say it's coming out on netflix or I, anyway so it's, yeah. it's supposed to come out next year they're starting to monetize their ip the um they still have opportunities to make mobile games yeah, and I think that um, will work both ways. And like, so just yeah. because they haven't poured a tremendous amount of resources or it hasn't been a lot of focus around mobile games in the past, they still have lots of opportunity. When I think about the games that could come out this year for Nintendo, I think there's going to be tremendous games. I'm fully expecting, you know, one character we haven't heard of in the Switch is Donkey Kong. I fully expect there to be some kind of Donkey Kong game or Metroid. Um, there's definitely going to be another Legend of Zelda. Um, yeah. And so there's going to be, you know, I think uh, games that slipped from last year to this year because of COVID and delays. Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting a, a, a new kind of Switch, Switch Pro. Um, phenomenal video game titles, a new theme park. Um, I think this is going to be a, a fantastic year for the Switch. Yeah, yeah, d definitely. Um, and, and, and for Nintendo. And so I look yeah. at it and I say, at 13 times earnings, it doesn't feel uh, I'm buying this incredible company and um, I don't think it's being valued properly. Yeah, so, so they're now more ag aggressive about monetizing the intellectual but, property. Uh, one, one last thing, yeah. going back to the Apple, the Apple comparison is really good. So if you look... Apple, three or four years ago, is considered a value stock, traded, traded six times EV mm -hmm. uh, enterprise value to free cash flow. Their cash flow is lower now than it was three or four years ago. Yeah. The stock is up four to five times. Why? Because people started to realize that their ecosystem, there wasn't going to be this boom bust. But the ecosystem was so powerful that they were building software uh, business, subscription businesses, service businesses that deserve to be valued higher. Yeah. And so yeah. what I would say is even in your scenario where we are at peak switch sales, yeah, people will start to realize that Nintendo is generating more and more of their revenue in a service-like environment with subscription-like margins with other things like downloadable content, add-ons to games, and that a higher, this company deserves a higher multiple. Yeah. And then, uh, but I, I actually bought Nintendo like a few years ago for a while, because at that time they were, they at some point they, they said they switched their mindset that they would do mobile games. And before they said, we will never do mobile games. And then they said, we will do mobile games. And I was like, okay, that's that could be a game changer. And it's super cheap because I was buying it. You know, there was so much cash and all the things you mentioned. So I bought it. And I think it got lucky with Pokemon Go or something because it did really well, well yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah so I, they own 20% of a company called Niantic, which yeah. makes Pokemon Go. Um, and it's an augmented reality game. It just saw their highest revenue uh, this past year that they've had, even though it's been out for years. Um, another piece of value that is not being valued correctly is that Nintendo has this relationship with one of the hottest 
um, video game making companies out there in Niantic. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, that they, they, I think they've gone back and forth around mobile, um, trying to think strategically how to chart a path. And I think where they've settled is mobile will be a feeder into their switch ecosystem, kind of like a marketing. Now, maybe they'll go back and, and try to um, come up with new mobile games, but I think they want to bring people into the Switch ecosystem um, to really combine hardware and software to provide something that's very, very different than what other companies are doing. And, that's um, their strategy. You may yeah. disagree with it. A no. lot of analysts do. I think they, they focus so much on creating games for the iPhone or Android that they're missing out on what Nintendo's trying to do. Um, and they unfairly punish the company and its valuation because of that. No, no, I'm just really interested how you think about it. Uh, and I don't necessarily, I actually kind of like Nintendo. I think they're, you make a lot of good points, but let's, let's go with this ecosystem. So it, are you thinking along the lines of they're building a, like an entire app store, like an Android or an, Appleism, or are you thinking well, yeah, about they, like they the Steam, their like e -shop. Steam platform? No, no, no. They, they, they're they eShop right now. If you want to buy a game, you can yeah. just buy it right on the Switch. Right. You don't have to go to the store. You can just download it right on your Switch. And and you think they'll give like developers opportunity to uh, to build straight into it? Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And, and so there are uh, independent game companies. They're starting yeah. to showcase they're called these indie showcases for independent yeah. games to say, hey, look, you can get this great independent game on the Switch. Yeah. And they're really doing a good job of like promoting smaller video game companies to make games for the Switch. No, and I think like the move to uh, like video conferencing and messaging, I think that um, makes your thesis like gives it more legs or more optionality because otherwise you would have to build like the phone functionality, which is... I think it's difficult because it never really succeeded well. But um, now I kind of lost my... Oh, wait. Do you... Did you by any chance read this book? Uh, it was called Nintendo versus Sega, I think. The, the console wars or something. No, I, I just... ring a bell? I, I haven't read. Oh, it's cool. And it's about um, the battle between Nintendo and Sega, I think in the 90s. And what happened... Uh, Nintendo had this great ecosystem. They had these consoles and they were dominating the market in the 90s. Like nobody came close. It was like Apple now. And then what happened is Nintendo squeezed everything it could out of the third party developers. And they complained and complained, but Nintendo didn't care because they controlled that system and they were just milking it. And it was great. And then and what then happened was Sega was getting closer. And at one point, Sega had a device and it was like equal. It was like a little bit better in some, some parts, a little bit worse in other parts. And just every developer couldn't wait to uh, abandon Nintendo because they hated them so much. But, but, but the, their entire revenue depended on them. And um, yeah, that, that, I think that's how Nintendo lost all of those... Um, Oh, I think my connection is unstable. Nintendo lost so many um, um, third-party developers, and it's like still visible, like that they're primarily making their own games. And yes. I think there's like a huge opportunity there because, come on, it's 20 years ago. They should be able to turn that well, around. I can tell so. you, I give you a great example of a uh, a game that's doing phenomenal on uh, the Switch that isn't made by Nintendo. It's called Just Dance. Made by uh, Ubisoft. Ubisoft, I think right. that's it. Um, super fun game. You Again, it's made for the Switch. You can take the uh, little Joy-Cons off and you basically mimic and dance and they, you know, it senses how you're moving and it gives you points based on... Uh, and so you look at the success of Just Dance, which isn't mm -hmm. made by Nintendo, and you can see that you can sell a lot of software on the Switch and you can be a third-party developer and do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, no another sure. example of a game that, that got very high reviews I haven't played yet is a game called Hades made by an independent company that yeah. did very well on the Switch. Yeah, but it, like their whole hardware platform it mainly makes sense to me if they would really grow that. Like, So I really hope they will. And, and, yeah. Well, I, they're, they're at like, I think they've said they're at like 60 million. I think they're getting to 150, 200 million the, the way I see it, there's going to be 150 or 200 million switches out there. Um, and I don't know what game company doesn't want to make games for a platform of that size. Uh, I, the, other th the last thing I would say that we haven't talked about is they partnered with Tencent to go into China. And they're starting to see success in China. And that is uh, definitely not in the stock as well. Right. Yeah, I th yeah. So, so they're now actually selling in in uh, in China. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because that was already I think talked about when I invested, and then it was falling through all. The it time. takes a while to get the approvals and go through all the process, but now they're selling. Yeah. Oh, this, uh, that's that's amazing. Um, yeah, I think I don't have any more pushback left. <laughs> like. Uh, you know, it, it could be that we're at peak switch sales and uh, earnings peak. And, uh, you know, you may be right. This may be a disappointing investment. And it maybe it's flat, it uh, goes down slightly. But the idea, especially with, you know, like $11, $12 billion in cash and what they have going on in this ecosystem, that it's going to fall precipitously just doesn't, with the IP that they have, it seems very, very unlikely to me. Yeah, and especially no. it feels like to talk about peak switch sales when they can't even keep up with demand. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about when uh, the switch is in, in, in selling. And then the last thing just that I'll mention is if you go on Amazon bestseller for video games, you'll see that the digital, the buying the digital gift cards uh, for Nintendo is like the number two seller. So right, people okay. are buying little digital gift cards little digital things to buy to use digital money on the switch and that's consistently one of the top three uh purchases you could just see how long this is going to last and how profitable yeah yeah that's a good point and then um maybe so something uh, nintendo has a little bit of a like disney like reputation and that it, it's really um it's games you know they're going to be okay for your kids. Um, That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, not too much violence, and um, but you're also kind of under monetized, maybe. Is that or you're not a believer? Yeah, that? that's fine. But I think they're working on long-term brands. They don't want to take advantage of their customers. Right. They want their customers to keep coming back and back. Right. So they they are not as aggressive with those things with like selling skins and. Uh, like, uh, no. okay, no, no, it's, it's again, it could get so more much. aggressive, not in the stock, right? There's yeah, a no, lot no. that's not in the stock, yeah, but it's, it's so it price. fits exactly fits your strategy because it's like the downside seems you know, I kind of have to make up really bad scenarios to, to have it go down, and there's a lot of optionality. and. I mean, you're, you're not saying like it's going to be this or it's going to be like this, but there are a lot of things that could improve a lot. Yes, or, that's right. Yeah, so I, I love it. I think it's great, great uh, investment case. Um, if you still have time, uh, do you still have a little bit of time left? We could maybe do... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? Um, you're interested in the um, cannabis space and yes. I know very I'm little about it. So. I have... Well, see, so remember when we were talking about value investing and yeah. how you value invest in a, in a time when you're competing against all these other people. So the U.S. has weird laws around cannabis, marijuana, mm -hmm. and then on the federal level, it's illegal, but on the state level, they're approving it and letting companies grow and sell in a highly regulated environment on a state level. Different states have different rules, et cetera, and how it works. And there's like a big argument and discussion about how it's going to work and 
how does the federal government respond? They're just kind of letting this happen mm -hmm. uh, to date. Um, but any, there are companies that run U.S. cannabis operations, but because it's federally illegal, they cannot list on a U.S. exchange. So you have these companies that actually trade in Canada, not even on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but on mm. secondary exchanges like this Canadian Securities Exchange or even one called the NEO, which you may have never heard of. And so if you're a pension fund institution, if you uh, prime broker assets in certain investment banks, they don't let you invest in a U.S. cannabis company that touches the flower has anything to do with it. And because of that, vast swaths of most of institutional investors own no exposure to US cannabis companies. And not only that, you, I'm sure you've heard of Robinhood, the trading app in the US, they're not allowed to buy any US cannabis companies either. Oh, I get Robert very not allowed to buy it because they prime broker with someone that doesn't want that federal potential of being sued because they might tangentially be doing business with an illegal enterprise. Oh. Okay, oh. would do great when, on Robinhood. What it would do great on Robinhood? Yes, and that's the opportunity. There is a sea change going on because of the presidential elections and because of the Georgia State Senate. The Democrats now control mm -hmm. Congress and the presidency, and they are pro-cannabis. They are pro-basically deregulating it or decriminalizing it. And I believe we are 12 to 24 months away from some kind of bill or something that gives legal shielding to banks and investment banks. And so right now there are regulatory barriers that are stopping investors from investing in a huge growth industry yeah. that is growing very fast. And when those regulatory barriers come down and these companies can trade on the NASDAQ, I believe they're going to be trading at very, very different valuations. And so I'm finding a tremendous opportunity to invest in companies like Air Strategies, that's AYR Strategies. Um, another one is Canopy Rivers. Um, these companies that are um, that I think you can be a value investor with Air Strategies. I believe I'm paying six times 2022 cash flow, eight to nine times this year's cash flow for a company that's growing at like 50 to 100 percent a year. That's remarkable to me. Uh, yeah, th th that's remarkable. And um, what, what is and the, it's because the, of re regulatory barriers that are stopping yeah. investors from investing in them. And so what Air Strategies does is they they grow and then have dispensaries that sell in what they call limited license markets. These are states that have very strict rules about who and how you can grow and sell um, cannabis. And so they're in Nevada, Massachusetts. They're expanding into Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Florida. And um, it's just a very interesting company. And so I'm spending a lot of time researching in cannabis because I like when other people um, are restricted from investing in great businesses. That gets me very excited. Yeah, no, this is actually a great um, way to invest or a great... Uh... Thing if you can find it but something you wrote about this actually something that's kept me away is a little bit of the there's been a bubble going on a few years back i think in Can canadian right yes now, so. but that see the difference was that was in canada mm -hmm. and what happened is canada is operating very differently than the u.s and created a rule and eco rules and ecosystem that were very different than the u.s and yeah. what happened is those Canadian companies could actually list in the U.S. because it was legal in Canada. So the crazy thing is, is companies like Tilray and Canopy Growth yeah. that operate legally in Canada for cannabis 
can trade in the U.S. And yeah. the U.S. companies who operate in the U.S. cannot list in the U.S. because on a federal level, it's illegal in the U.S. to operate a cannabis company. Right. So what happens is there were very few ways There a lot of investors were like, I'm so excited to invest in cannabis. And they just threw money, kind of like at the like electric vehicle style, mm -hmm. you know, like the electric vehicle bubble going on right now. Threw money and you had this massive bubble and these companies promised these huge returns and they hadn't, they lit, lit money on fire like you can't imagine. The difference is the yeah. US cannabis companies are producing tremendous cash flow. Air Strategies in 2022 is gonna produce something like north of $300 million of EBITDA. This year, they're gonna produce $200 million in EBITDA. That's a lot of cash. Yeah, so so you really enlightened me because I was just one of those uh, idiots who just was like, oh yeah, this uh, all these stupid ca cannabis companies. And when I look at one and it's it traded a crazy valuation, something was really trashy. One of the biggest, the, yeah, the biggest mistakes is people conflate the Canadian and the U.S. companies together, and they're totally different markets, yeah. totally different regulatory systems. Um, but now that I, I want you to appreciate that the no, U.S. already yeah. has a very large cannabis market. It's just no, but, illegal. Yeah. The I estimates think, yeah. are that the illegal cannabis market in the U.S. is something like 60 or 70 billion dollars. Illegal. Yeah. That is all. A lot of that is going to shift to become legal. And it's a massive, massive market. No, yeah, yeah. I've been, um, you know, I know, I've been living in a country, I've grown up in a country where uh, marijuana has been legal. I think since I've been in my teens, at least, and uh, it's actually one of the smaller markets uh, on a global scale, <clears throat> but it's legal, and it there's a lot of shops where you can buy it, and it's obviously there's a lot of revenue. Uh, well, yeah. but imagine, imagine if instead of a lot of shops. Yeah. in the city you live mm -hmm. imagine if there were five and yeah, imagine those, those you, could, be you could you could invest in the company that owns one of the five does that yeah. sound like a good business to you no i think even now they're great businesses but here it's it has its own no, no but just imagine yeah. if the regulatory environment was different where it was a lot tighter and whoever held that limited license becomes uh, ha, that becomes enormously valuable yeah but, but in a way that's how it is how it is here so it's it's re, yeah it's valuable uh but now let, let's focus on the on the u.s uh, thing because there we can actually invest um so how does that ir strategic okay. business actually look like are they growing it and then uh, selling it or, or what are they yeah they're, they're they're growing it and selling it yeah and they're expanding into markets. I want to say they're in uh, seven markets now, and their goal is to get to ten, to seven states, and their goal is to get to ten to twelve. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think this is a business that a couple of years down the road is going to be doing like a half a billion dollars in cash flow, and is going to be one of the top cannabis companies in the U.S. And it's just not being valued correctly. Um, yeah. I, I have written about it a couple of times, um, specifically last summer. Uh, it's increased about 100% in price since this past summer, but I wrote about it. And it basically, I believe that cannabis is going to, the sector is going to act like the new SaaS or software right. as a software type company. These companies are putting up 70% plus gross margins and huge growth opportunities, huge adjustable markets, but they're not being valued correctly, probably yeah. because there's not a lot of institutional participation. There's not a lot of retail participation, but that's changing. But, uh, and yeah. let me tell you, when these things can trade on the NASDAQ, it is going to, it, it has the potential to make the electric vehicle bubble look small. Yeah, actually, I buy, you know, I buy this, this uh, thesis or it sounds really compelling to me but then how do you think about okay gets it's legal now there are multiple competitors or there were like a few licensed operators but then it's 
it's actually like farming, you know, you can grow it at scale. You can maybe use greenhouses or something. But that's when it's fully deregulated and you can grow it and it can cross state lines. I don't think right. that that's going to happen anytime soon. So, but the, how many competitors are there like within a state or? It depends on the state. Okay. You see, in the state of Massachusetts, a company can only own three dispensaries. Right. So there will be many. It's taken, it's taken air strategies two and a half years to get to a recreational license for some of their stores. And it, control even goes down to the local municipality. Yeah. Where some cities say, I don't care what the state says, we're not allowing it in our, our city. Yeah. Or you can't operate within 500 yards of the school. There are crazy restrictions around who can grow where, where can you sell, who can sell, how do you get a license from the regulatory bodies. And then there are some states where you have to, uh, you have to grow it and sell it. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can't just operate a dispensary. You have to grow it as well. There yeah. are some states that you can operate a dispensary and buy, but no cannabis is crossing state lines right now. Right. Okay. So, so there's, that's going to slow that down a lot, but because that would like indicate falling multiples over time, but you see that being a long way. Yeah. Right? And one day we'll get there. I just think we're a lot like in the seventies, alcohol distribution in the U S was very much like this. Couldn't cross yeah. state lines, uh, you know, limited stores, heavy regulation, uh, things like that. I think, I think it's just going to be a while. And yeah. from what I can tell from what the Democrats um, and what the people, in, you'll probably have a lot of push down to the state level. They'll say mm -hmm. federal government is not going to go after anyone. We're going to decriminalize the possession of this. We're going to try to make up for the people that have been put in jail over this. And the states, you can control it. We won't. We won't cause any, and, and, and what will happen is that the banks hopefully and the exchanges will get uh, legal shielding from working from them. The cost of capital will fall. The states will keep their regulatory uh, framework in place. And let me tell you, these businesses are just very, could be very, very valuable. No. And so I, like air, yeah. air, you know, eight or nine times this year, six times next year, you know, going out to, you know, 2023, potentially three times, three or four times, like, I don't think my downsides very much, if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, if it can keep up pricing, I mean, it's like printing money. It's, it's, it doesn't, it's very cheap to grow if you are the one that can sell it. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And um, let me think. I have one last thought about it. Oh, Hannah, how do you how do you look at like all the opportunities around? They want to put it in drinks and um, oh, brand I think there's stuff. a tremendous opportunity in brands right now. There really aren't many brands or a lot of valuable brands because mm -hmm. so much of the opportunity is controlled from the retail dispensary since there's so few of them. Mm -hmm. But I think there is going, the big, big opportunity in the next five or 10 years is there's going to be a branded company or branded products that are going to explode on the seed. I think you're going to have cannabis, THC, CBD, CBN, all these different cannabinoids are going to find their way into food and drinks like you can't imagine. And there is an enormous opportunity, yeah. enormous opportunity. And so that's, I'm doing a lot of work on that and trying to understand where that may be. Um, but I think the next great opportunity will be in the next five years around branded products yeah. in cannabis. Hey, and then the dispensaries, those are like the, the shops, right? But, and you, yes. those have to be manned, right? You can run yes. in man shops. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's makes sense, but, uh, too bad. Um, uh, let me see. Did, did you have uh, one more company, or uh, do you, if you have to go, it's, it's totally fine. Yeah, I guess two more minutes, and yeah. then I'll just talk about uh, a company close to your home, Le Francais de Joux, 
France oh, privatized yeah. their n- national lottery and sports gambling monopoly. And it's pretty incredible. I get on the company has essentially no debt and I get to buy what is a true monopoly at a 5% free cash flow yield that over the next two years is growing to like a 7% free cash flow yield. Um, and uh, unlevered, it's just incredible. The most resilient business I've ever invested in where the entire French economy got shut down in April, all sports stopped and somehow the company broke even in the second quarter. And then in July, when everything kind of reopened, they went back to normal. They went back to 2019 levels. And so if you told me there was a business that was this resilient, that had um, that was a monopoly, that has growth in sports gambling, and more and more people are now playing online lottery, so mm-hmm. the margins are double, uh, the business is now structurally more profitable than it was uh, pre-COVID. And it's just amazing to me that I get to buy it at like a such an amazing business at a 5% free cash flow yield. Unlevered. Wow. wow. And, and do you have any idea why the French are not catching up to this? Oh, I think the French are the one of the few that own it. <laughs> okay. I just don't think it's known very well outside of France. Right. But the yeah. idea that French government bonds are negative, mm-hmm. traded negative interest rates, a lottery is effectively a tax. So when I buy uh, FDJ, it is an arm of the French government that I am buying for a 5% growing free cash flow yield. And yet there are institutions out there buying French government bonds at a negative interest rate. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And the government has a stake in this uh, company? Yeah, they own 20% yeah. of it. Okay. Yes. So that's that's actually great because uh, it really diminishes the chances that you get uh, yep. regulated. Um, so Aaron, thank you so much. It was, it's been My fascinating pleasure. to uh, hear you talk about this uh, companies. Um, if people want to reach out to you or... Um, uh, yeah, they can find me on Twitter. It's Aaron Value, A-A-R-O-N and then Value. And then they can also find my Substack, which is mindsetvalue.substack.com. That's my weekly newsletter. Yeah, and I'll definitely uh, uh, make sure to link people to those. Everybody who's been listening, thank you very much. Uh, please, thank you for uh, having me. Yeah, like or subscribe. And uh, uh, until next time, thank you, Aaron. Thank you.